In this video, we'll consider two matrix products that produce somewhat surprising results. You will notice that all the matrices consist of nothing but integers, which is what makes the results a little bit surprising. And the question in both cases will be, how did I come up with examples like these? So I will now write in the surprising answers, and you should probably pause the video and multiply out these matrices on your own and discover the surprising results that I'm talking about. Let me write in the answers. All right, so the top two matrices combine to produce the zero matrix. This is just another way in which matrix multiplication is different from multiplication of ordinary numbers. With ordinary numbers, the only way to get zero as the result of a product is for one of the numbers to be zero. But here, we have two matrices that are as different from zero as it gets. They're full of numbers, yet the result is zero. So it's at the very least slightly surprising. But this example will have a simple explanation, and there's a very simple way of coming up with matrices like these. This will be just a little bit more intriguing. Here, these matrices combine to produce the identity matrix. So these matrices are the inverses of each other. So why is that surprising? Well, that's a little bit surprising, because if you think of the inversion algorithm and think of performing Gaussian elimination on this matrix with a pivot like this, you will have a lot of fractions. And indeed you would. In the course of Gaussian elimination, you would be dealing with a lot of fractions. But by the end, uh, all the fractions will go away and you'll be left with a clean matrix, this one. So is it surprising that it's possible? No, I don't think it's surprising that it's possible. There is nothing that says that a matrix that's full of integers and no unit pivots must have fractions in the inverse. There is no theorem and there's nothing, there's no evidence pointing to that. But how does one come up with matrices like this? Uh, well, it's not very difficult, but it's very interesting to think about. So I think you should pause the video again and think about how you would come up with examples like these. So we'll start with the top example, which is very easy to explain and very easy to come up with a strategy for thinking of other examples like this one. All you have to do is realize that what's going on here is just about the null space. What's going on is nothing more than the fact that these columns are in the null space of this matrix. So I could have come up with a hundred columns like this that produce a hundred columns of zeros. I would just take the vectors in the basis of the null space and start finding various linear combinations of those columns. I would make sure that those linear combinations are integer linear combinations, that the coefficients are integers, and that would produce as many columns in the null space as I would like. So that's how I can come up with as many columns like this as I would like. So this matrix would have been four by 100, producing four by 100 matrix of all zeros. Now you just have to make sure that you know the null space of the matrix on the left and that it has a rich null space. If it only has a one dimensional null space, then you will quickly realize that all of these columns are multiples of each other. So that would be boring and completely transparent. So you have to make sure that the dimension of the null space of this matrix is at least two. How would you do that? It's also very easy. You would write down two columns that look slightly complicated. And then for the remaining two columns, you would just take various linear combinations of these two columns. Don't make them one and one because that your eye might pick out. So make them three and minus two or eight and seven. And you know, throwing in a minus sign is good to keep the numbers small or take advantage of these minus signs. Whatever you do, it'll be fine as long as you obscure the null space a little bit. So don't take simple linear combinations, take slightly more complicated linear combinations. Then you'll know the null space of this matrix. It'll be at least two dimensional. So then you'll take the basis of the null space, which you don't even have to calculate because you know what it is having created this matrix and start throwing various linear combinations of those uh, elements in the null space bases into this matrix. And there you go. So you could have made this example as complicated as you wanted, as rich as you wanted, and as large as you wanted. Just a very simple thing. Looks surprising at first, but just shows you how commonplace this sort of situation is where two matrices 
combine to produce the zero matrix. Not at all difficult to come up with. This uh, took me a few more minutes. <laughs> Not a complicated thing at all. Uh, it takes just a little bit of experience with inverting matrix and the inversion algorithm. And later on when you learn about determinants, uh, that will provide an additional insight to this problem. But let me show you an easy way to do it. While I'm erasing this and waiting for the blackboard to dry, I'll probably turn the camera off and then turn it back on. So you should probably pause the video and try to think of a matrix that's not as complicated as this, maybe halfway between being the identity matrix and something like this, whose inversion is guaranteed to result in a matrix that has nothing but integers. Think triangular matrices. All right, here is one kind of matrix that's guaranteed to have an inverse with integer values. And to realize this, all you need to do is think about the matrix inversion algorithm. Let me put ones on the diagonal, which is always helpful. And just make it a upper triangular matrix, an upper triangular matrix. And I can put any integers here I want. I'm not reproducing the matrices that were here before. I will create a whole new set of matrices that has that nice property. Okay, so this matrix is guaranteed to have an inverse that has nothing but integers. In fact, it'll have ones on the diagonal throughout. So all the pivots are ones, they're already present. So if you think of the matrix inversion algorithm where you put the identity next to this matrix and go ahead with Gaussian elimination, well, it will only involve integer operations and the inverse will consist of all integers. Now, if I put another upper triangular matrix next to it, I would result with a product of two upper triangular matrices and would have a third upper triangular matrix. And that would be uh, not as intriguing as the example that I had on the board. So I will use a lower triangular matrix that has the same property. Oops. Put ones on the diagonal and then whatever integers you want below the diagonal. This matrix also has nothing but integers in its inverse. And so the product of these matrices will have nothing but integers in its inverse. Why is that? That has to do with the inversion of the product formula, the inverse of a product. So let me in fact call this matrix U for upper and this matrix L for lower. I'll step out of the shot partially and show you why the statement that I just made is true. That if this matrix has nothing but integers in the inverse and this matrix has nothing but integers in the inverse, their product has nothing but integers in the inverse. Well, their product is UL. And as you know, the inverse of UL is L inverse, U inverse. And L inverse has nothing but integers in it. And U inverse has nothing but integers in it. And when you multiply two matrices full of integers, you'll get a third matrix that's full of integers. And so this matrix, its inverse, consists of nothing but integers. And there you have it.